Thank you so much for coming. This is a great turnout. I assume you're here to hear her. <laughs> Not me as much, but, um, but thank you uh, again for coming. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is look at the minutes that are, I think are on the table. We need to approve those as just our first order of business. Is that all? Yeah. Okay. So um, I assume that you've all had a chance to read them thoroughly and consider carefully whether you agree that these are accurate minutes from the last meeting. Um, but if there are no questions about this issue, are there any questions about the minutes from the last meeting? Okay, then all in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And any opposed to approving the minutes from the last meeting? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we are still searching for a vice president, if anybody feels like coming forward. We had a nice board meeting um, a couple weeks ago where we all kind of gathered together and got to talk through a few things. So that's really, you know, at this point kind of what we're interested in is anybody who's interested in serving on the board and kind of, you know, thinking a little bit more in depth than we can get during these meetings about what we want to do with our <coughs> fundraising efforts and everything. So uh, just let us know if you're interested in that. And we also are still looking for a fundraising chair. So um, having said those things, please, and please let me or Neil or John know if you're interested in serving in that capacity. So I'm going to move on to Bridget's presentation on the um, advanced academic placement plan. Okay, thanks for coming. Um, Y'all know me. Um, I'd like to introduce, if you don't know, Margie Campbell. She is our advanced academic resource teacher and she is with us part-time. That's the standard issue for Fairfax County is a half-time um, AART. And then we have Kirsten Maloney here with us from the Advanced Academic Office. And what we'd like to do today is to talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about the continuum of, of services, a little bit about the philosophy, um, and then more specifically towards the end about um, our decision and uh, pending proposal to begin a local level four program here at Woodburn. So, um, I think it would help if I open the door. And I always get here early and I turn it on and then it goes off. So just bear with time. me for just a moment. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll talk. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. While it's warming up. Uh, the gift to, well, the Advanced Academics Office uh, and the programs, we have four different <laughs> levels of services. And what we're trying to do is meet the needs of all the students. And what we look at, uh, when we look at students, we're looking at their potential. Um, there was a shift years ago uh, from calling it the gifted and talented program to actually now we just have levels of services. Um, and the idea is to match the student with the appropriate level that, that meets their instructional need. Um, we're always looking, uh, even more than this, uh, we're, we're looking that uh, students can change. Intelligence is not something that is fixed. Um, there's a nurtured nature sort of argument, but we really believe that with uh, the right kind of instruction, Keeping that curiosity growing for students will advance their abilities in a lot of ways. So again, we like to see students that have that natural ability, but we're also trying actively to bring it out of them. And to do that, you have to keep them a little bit out of their comfort zone. So intelligence is not how much you know or how quickly you get the answer, but what you do when you don't know the answer. Uh, Carol Dweck. Uh, uh, an, an exceptional uh, researcher and educator did a lot of research on this fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And that is what we're trying to encourage in all of our students. Um, how many of you grew up saying, I'm not any good at math, right? 
I did. <laughs> and that's probably because at some point you struggled, you didn't know how to resolve a problem, you didn't have the support, you didn't know how to access uh, or advocate for yourself or access the resources to help you. So what we're trying to do is to keep that from developing, uh, keep children a, a little bit uncomfortable, that's where they're learning, but offer that support and access and advocacy to keep them engaged. Um, that is one thing that our advanced academics program does really well. Uh, Kirsten, the expert. <laughs> So this is our continuum of services that shows what options there are for students in elementary, middle, and high school. And we like to emphasize that there's no singular path um, on here, that students can start off being a level two student and then take honors and still apply for TJ, or they, you have curriculum choices about AP or IB when you get to high school, whether or not you want to pursue that. So um, the big thing with us is that we want to, as Margie said, um, match the services that a student needs at a given time, knowing that those needs can change over time. Um, we're trying to provide high levels and of challenge to any student who's able to handle it. Um, so in elementary school, all students get the level one, nine critical and creative thinking strategies. Those are strategies that are pretty easy to integrate into daily instruction. Um, and Dr. Horn has written articles about each one of them and things that you can do at home if you haven't seen those yet that are on the public website. Level two is if your child is strong in a particular subject area, they can start using the curriculum off of the AP curriculum framework. And that curriculum is the same curriculum that's used for level two, for level three, and level four. The only difference is, is it being used in all subject areas and is it being used on a full-time or part-time basis. Um, but it's that same curriculum for all, for all of them. Um, and then part-time is when you start seeing direct services with the advanced academic resource teacher. Um, and full-time is what you all are exploring here, um, which is whether or not you want to start offering that full-time curriculum at Woodburn. So level four services overall, um, we have 28 elementary centers and 12 middle school centers. And that um, would, those are the centers where students would be, um, it might be their base school, but if the center is serving their school is different, then they get provided transportation. Um, and then, but we had a grassroots effort a number of years ago from um, schools for two different reasons to start local level fours. One was that some schools were noticing we're sending a whole class of eligible students off to another school. Why don't we provide that here at the local school so that they can be with their friends? The other was there were parents at a school who said, we really value being in the neighborhood and we want this for more of our children, so let's start to offer this here. Um, in both cases, parents have a choice whether or not they're going to send their child to the designated center or stay at the local school and receive the curriculum. And it's been, it started off with just a couple, it keeps growing more and more um, because it is so successful. And what we really love about it is that it's opening up opportunities to more and more children um, and building the teacher's capacity to use the curriculum um, for more of the students school-wide. So, all of those resources, all the curriculum that I think Margie has laid out back there, line up perfectly with a portion of a graduate. Um, they're gonna teach those deeper skills, a lot of collaboration, a lot of critical thinking. Um, so it's really good for everybody. Um, and then um, doing this opens it up. So it is highly challenging curriculum and instruction in third grade. There is accelerated math. So third graders would be taking fourth grade math and fourth graders would be taking fifth grade math fifth graders would be taking sixth grade math, and that's the first year in fifth grade when they would take an out of level SOL for the math test. All the other subject areas, the um, acceleration wouldn't necessarily be out of grade level, so in social studies you wouldn't start studying the grade level above of social studies, but you would be taking a different approach to the, the study and going into greater depth and complexity. Um, when students get to middle school, full-time honors is also considered level four services. So. Some of the students who end up being placed in a local level four class who might not be officially eligible for the center um, elect to go to the middle school and take full honors. I also used to be a center teacher and some of my center students who were officially eligible would still go and take full honors at the middle school because their bus ride would be so much longer to go to the designated center school and, and the parent was like, no, let's just go here, shorter bus ride, you'll be with the same friends that you will be with when you get to high school and so they made that decision for their family. Um, I think I may have already spoken about all of these things. I think I did. All right. 
All right, so what are the local level four services? Those that are eligible students get to stay at the, at the local school and receive level four services. Um, they, the teacher training is the same, whether it's um, a, stu a teacher for a local level four or a level four. So teachers who um, teach full-time advanced academics have five years to get their advanced academic endorsement. Um, and we find often that when schools get really deliberate about opening a local level four, they are really proactive about getting that training and the teachers sometimes are even better trained than the level percent of teachers who, who may not have had that advance notice and planning. Um, so the endorsement is one thing that's comprised of four free credit classes that, special, that help them get special knowledge in the needs of advanced learners. And the other component to that is curriculum training. So they would go to um, our professional development sessions and learn about how to use the units for their particular grade level. And that's the really practical stuff they need to know um, to hit the ground running once they get in there with their kids. Sorry, so how long does it take them to get trained up? They have, for the endorsement, they get they have up to five years for the four It doesn't take that long. It's just, when you, like I can go and teach in a level four center without the, the certification as long as I make sure I get it within five years. Mm -hmm. That's the same. I'm already, a, I'm already a licensed teacher. It's yeah. just adding another endorsement on, which is not a huge big deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the same for center and local level four. Um, <laughs> And the, uh, look, what I think is even more important when you're starting out is the okay. curriculum training. And those are offered, like we have a summer institute the week after teachers get out, and they can sign up to come. We have daily full day sessions, so they can say, hey, I need to come to these three and just sign up for those three. Um, so those are open. Um, and then in the fall, we also do a lot of professional development in the fall as well. So in case teachers weren't, they didn't know they had the job in the, you know, for the summer institute, they can still come in the fall and get that training. Right. So, why now? Well, a couple things we've noticed. The first thing is the, the changes in um, teaching and learning. Um, teaching and learning has really changed a lot. Um, you know, I've been here 13 years and things have changed a lot, and certainly in my 20 years, um, in Fairfax. Um, what used to be limited to the um, advanced academic programs, what used to only be done there, is now a part of everybody's learning. We, we expect all students to be able to explain their thinking. We expect all students to be able to solve problems in multiple ways. So a lot of the things that were previously reserved are now have floated down especially due to our portrait of a graduate, um, the new, that new initiative, um, we expect this of a lot of students. So a lot of the things that teachers are doing in classrooms now were things that when I was at Hunters Wood, which was a center school before I came to Woodburn, that was only happening in the center. And now a lot of those things are happening. So it's not as huge a leap as it would have been. Um, multiple entry points. We're very, very adept now at having uh, you know, one problem-based learning activity that has a lot of different entry points depending on where you are, from the most advanced learner to maybe a, you know, a child that, that might struggle, might be a special education student. So we can do a lot more with the ways we're teaching now to accommodate a lot more different variety of learners. Um, the increased rigor for all I've, I've talked about. And also the focus on the whole child. We never lost that here at Woodburn. We never got, you know, hyper-focused on just those SOL scores because we believed that the arts was very, are very important. We've, we've um, been kind of the lone wolf out there for a long time, and we're glad to see that some of these things are coming back. Creative and critical thinker is an important part. So we feel like we, you know, hey, we were here all along. Um, but because of all of those things, that was one of our reasons to, to really start to look at um, possibly offering this. Uh, another reason was <coughs> families. We were hearing from families. You know, I want my child to have this challenge, but I really don't want to leave Woodburn. We love you guys. We like being here. We like the arts integration. Um, you know, we want our children to be in their neighborhood school. We really don't want to go off, um, you know, all the way over there to Mantua. Um, our pyramid is one of the few pyramids that does not have a, a level four academic center within the pyramid. 
um, just because we no one ever had any room for that. So um, it's always been over at Mantua. So it's out of our pyramid. Um, I think the sense of community that folks have, this um, especially in the immediate neighborhood, you know, it's like going back to the neighborhood of my childhood where, you know, the kids are all running around the streets, everybody's hopping from house to house. It's really a nice feeling um, in our community. So we really would, you know, we, we heard that from families. I heard it more formally um, last year. Some folks were really interested in, in, you know, would this be something we could do? So we started to look in, into it. So what's the process? It's not a, it, it's a year-long process. Um, the first step was to broach this with the teaching staff, which we just, we had a nice discussion um, in June about was this something we would like to pursue, and the response was quite positive. So um, over the summer, we really started to think about um, how this would work. I had a conversation with um, Dr. Zuluaga, our region assistant superintendent in September, um, that we were looking to pursue this. He was very encouraging. He had a couple of qualifiers that he wanted to make sure we considered, and, um, but gave his blessing to proceed. Um, the parent and staff survey <coughs> were sent out in October and November, and Margie's gonna talk a little bit about um, the parent survey in a minute. Um, the parent presentation, you're here tonight for this. Um, we will s finish up our proposal and submit it to our region superintendent in December. Um, those are considered all the way up the leadership chain, and then the approval is made in March so that if you had a student that was going to be eligible, um, you would know whether or not we were gonna be able to offer the local level four before you had to make a decision about going to Mantua. So that's the process. Um, we did do the um, community survey, and uh, Ms. Campbell took, her, took it on herself to get it all compiled for us, because this is something we do have to include in our proposal. So she, uh, we can have her talk a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. All right. Okay, so it was, it was wonderful. Um, and we thank you all uh, for your participation. Uh, what we did, uh, we issued through the keep in touch message. We had an electronic version that you could fill out. We also uh, sent out in uh, the Thursday folders uh, a, an English survey and similarly a, a Spanish survey. And we had a wonderful result. About 20% of our school population did respond. Of course, we would have loved it to be greater, but um, the nice part was of the 106 uh, responses received, uh, a number of them did come from our, our Hispanic population. And, you know, this is a part, of, a large part of Woodburn Elementary's community, and we do want them to be represented. Uh, and we want to hear what their concerns are. And they voiced a number of questions that were very relevant. So we'll share those in just a couple minutes. Um, if you have any questions about any of these results, just uh, shout out. And if not, um, the first question, there were five questions on the survey. <clears throat> the first one was um, level of agreement with the proposal to provide the level four advanced academic services at Woodburn. And as you can see, the options were strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or no opinion. And you know, this quadrant right here, fantastic. You know, a, a, a lot of great support. Um, and you know, for uh, and whoever is in disagreement, we would love to talk with you. Um, and find out if we can uh, figure out what issues you may have with regard to that. Question two, uh, we had a number of scenarios. Uh, the first scenario would be if your child is found eligible, would you be interested in staying here and, and placing your student here at Woodburn when you have an option to go to Mantua or Woodburn? And again, of the total number of respondents, um, a significant amount of, of families thought that they would be interested in that. Another option is if your child is not found eligible, but we would like to place them in uh, to receive this uh, level four service. Again, another very uh, positive response from families. The last one, or not the last one, but the ch if your child is not chosen to receive the level four services, um, how would you feel about 
but still going forward with this possibility. And, and uh, uh, wonderfully, uh, a nice response was it was the same. You know, whether your child's going to participate or not, we feel that this is a, a, the way we interpret it. We feel that it would be a better uh, uh, service to provide for our community. Um, and lastly, there, there was a, a few people who just didn't agree with it. Oh, well, we'll do it again. Uh, the third question, we wanted to find out what you thought the benefits were. And just briefly, um, number one, as, as Bridget mentioned, you know, having your students stay in the Woodbury community. Another one, uh, having a higher level of education for those students who need it. But the way our plan is, it will really uh, kind of be embedded for all students. Uh, there will be benefits, again, for the whole student body. Having those levels of students stay in our community. Um, students learn from each other as much as they learn from the teachers. And, and when we have students that have that depth and breadth of knowledge and experiences, you know, they can just, they, all of the students, all the whole class just benefits from that dynamic. Um, what do we have to give up? Uh, we don't have to give up our arts integration program. That is, that is a mainstay. Um, we uh, will be raising the expectations for all students, and that is the truth. Uh, we have a, an opportunity for all of the students to access the same process while, it, while maybe the product may look a little different. Um, there'll be innovation in the classroom with access to different resources. Uh, we'll have a closer knit community, more parents to participate in the PTA, um, and that just uh, grows very organically. Uh, it'll add value to the local neighborhood. Um, and we're going to see a lot of integrated classrooms. Uh, so even students that may not have had the opportunity to have access to those resources, um, they'll still benefit from using these higher level resources. Question four was what are some of the challenges? Um, and this is true. <clears throat> Maintaining the appropriate class size and diversity within the school. But our plan is going, and, and Bridget will talk about that in a few minutes, our plan is going to uh, really integrate all of these things. So the impact should be minimal. And for staffing is staff. Right, staffing is staffing. We staffed by the number of kids that are here. Our plan to roll it out will be, you know, over a, over a process, so it isn't something, it's something that will be very easily managed. Um, another concern is making sure that all classes are as challenged as a level four center. As, as Kirsten even said, you know, we'll be using the same resources. The teachers will be trained, uh, very currently tra trained, uh, kind of have their finger on the pulse of everything that's new. Uh, we'll be using the same resources. So the rigor, the level of rigor should be there. Um, filling classes with enough qualified students. Um, as a teacher here at Woodbury, I'm getting to work with all of the students. We <coughs> certainly have, I can guarantee, plenty of qualified students. Um, and again, we're looking at not the typical metrics that you might look at. We have a lot of talented students um, in many different ways, and, and that's what we're going to bring out. Um, acquiring resources is not going to be a problem. Bridget will talk to you about that. Changing uh, to teaching staff and or assignments. Uh, we don't, part of this was also to do a staff survey, and we have been getting a lot of feedback from our staff. We have a number of staff who are very excited about this possibility and are excited about getting the additional training required. Uh, comparable level of services uh, due to economies of scale. I almost think because we're smaller, we do everything a little better. Uh, we get to know your kids really, really well. Um, it's not going to implement our ability to use these resources at all. It might even make it a little easier. Uh, finding the innovative teachers who can meet the needs of all levels of students. Uh, the neat thing, I, I never taught at a Title I school personally until I came here. These are some of the best teachers in Fairbright County. Um, they're exceptional. They're exceptional at working with every level of student. So I personally don't see a problem there. I think Bridget uh, picked some pretty amazing people to work here. Um, adding to the strain in the current workload, it will be an additional amount of training. It will be something new. but. Uh, what's going to happen is that the teachers are going to see how excited the kids are using these resources, but again, it's just, it, it's all going to grow into new. Um, and not clear how the services will be offered, we'll talk about that, and space in the school buildings is not being issue. 
a great question. Um, these were some of the questions that did come up, and you would think, yeah. Yeah, and Margie, we're in your voice. <laughs> um, will the first question, would it be the center model? Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as I lay out what we're thinking. Um, the distinction between the level four center services and local level four, I think Kirsten addressed, um, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, there are some differences. Your child, you know, is in a school that has multiple classes at the grade level if you're at, at the center school. Here it's going to be a smaller, uh, more organic kind of a program. Um, will students from other schools come to Woodburn? No. This is our local level four, not like Mantua. We're not opening a center. We're just opening having the services for the students who live in our boundary. Um, so no, we wouldn't have a students from other schools. Students at Mantua will have a choice of schools. We'll talk about that in a few minutes with our well well. Um, would we need to give up something to get the program? Not really. Um, I don't think our, we would give up our art integration. Um, I don't see this as a giving up something. Um, I do see it possibly with curriculum as trading out some resources and using some different resources and we're already embarked on that process. Um, the funding, it's really not a difference in funding, it's curriculum. The pieces of curriculum are really, in the grand scheme of things, not hugely expensive. So I don't see that as an issue. Um, many of them we already own. So it wouldn't be a problem. Um, our teachers, when they have gone, and many of them have already gone to some of the training for the different curriculum pieces as we've started to use them already. Um, they get it when they go to training a lot of times. So we've kind of you know, gotten things that way. So it's really not a huge impact that would you know, need to be addressed. So we really wouldn't be losing anything else by you know, making sure we had everything that we needed. Um, uh, level three get the same amount of attention. Um, chances are the students that are level three are the students that would be invited into uh, with the level four students, much in the same way as we are doing math now. Um, last year we began offering the advanced math, um, which is the same curriculum as the center program. We started offering it in, in grades three, four, five, and six. And so what happens now is we do invite kids that have demonstrated um, pro a proficiency in math and an ability to handle the, that challenge, we are inviting them into those classes now. So we've been doing this now. Uh, we've been doing it for a very long time in sixth grade. We've expanded um, in the last few years uh, to offer that same thing at, at, at grades three, four, five, and six. And I think that's become a good um, kind of get your feet wet for the proposal that we're going to make because we've had some experience in doing this um, at, at each grade level. Um, uh, preparation, you know, kids, we are trying to give every child a rigorous experience and to tweak their curiosity and to teach them to ask questions and, and struggle when they don't know the answer. You know, um, that's a big part of of what makes students eligible and ready for challenging things is when they are faced with something they don't know and they figure out, well, what do I know and what could I try and how could I go forward? Um, that's the true definition of really being an intelligent person is knowing what to do when you don't have that answer, when you don't know uh, what to do. And we've been working hard um, to really prepare kids and give kids those kinds of experiences all along, um, in, especially in the last couple of years. We've changed the way we deliver math instruction. It's a lot more open-ended, a lot more uh, problem-oriented, where kids are solving things, um, you know, that they may not know how to solve, but they're, they're applying their knowledge. Um, so, we hope that we're actually preparing every child to be a deeper thinker, a more creative and um, thinker as well. Um, how will children be chosen with accuracy according to, you know, how would we choose kids to be a part of this program that are not? Well, we're gonna start with the group that is actually formally identified, and that's a county committee, um, and that's not done by us. We prepare the packets, we send them 
those students are identified. So that would be the core group. Um, after that, I think we're going to apply the criterion in much the same way as we're doing for the math. We're going to look back at what, what do we know about this child? How have they performed in the past? What does their teacher say about their ability to problem solve, their ability to accept challenge, their ability to think through and to continue to persevere? So we're going to look at a broad range of criterion to figure out, okay, which children are we going to invite into this group? So um, I think by doing the math the last few years, we've, we've really kind of gotten good at that process and making sure that we're not overlooking someone who um, you know, might, be, might rise to that challenge. And I think it's been pretty successful. Um, so what's it going to look like here? Here's the proposal that we are um, looking at. We want to start small because we want, again, somebody mentioned the stress on teachers. So we do want to start with the first group, which would be a, a third grade class next fall. So students that were in second grade that were identified for level four services would have the option next fall, assuming everything is approved. Um, we would then add that grade, you know, that group would, would add a grade each year. So we would continue, so eventually we would have all the way to sixth grade. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that Dr. Zulaga and I are concerned about is we are not a large enough school to have a full class of level three and four students. We're just too small. Um, and that's been a concern, and it was a concern of his, you know. So what he's in favor of and what I was thinking was that we would cluster the students in a class that's built just like we build every other class. So those students would be clustered there. Then we could use the regrouping, like we're doing for math now, to provide that advanced academic um, curriculum for those students, as well as any other students. And we're doing this in math now. So in math now, if you're in third grade, you have your home, everybody's in a homeroom. Those homerooms are heterogeneous. They're not divided by ability. Um, what happens in math is the, the students actually change to another teacher. So there will be one teacher in third grade that is teaching the advanced academic. The children from all, those, all the class go to her and the students that she has for the advanced, that are eligible to be in that program, they stay there. The other students are in the other two classes. We actually were doing this um, a while back, it had been a practice at Woodburn to do this for more than just math. And so we're sort of going back to this, but with, um, without some of the things that, that we didn't like about it at, at first. So we know this is viable for math. I think it'll be viable for language arts as well. We're already doing a little bit of it in language arts. Every now and then, we will have a student who Maybe we don't know because they've come from another school and we place them in a class and we realize, oh wow, this, this child is really an advanced reader and there's nobody else in their classroom that is advanced, but there's two other kids over here in this classroom. So for language arts, we'll just bring that child over to join those other two and then that way they have academic peers in the classroom. So we're, we're looking at doing this with, a, with some flexible grouping. Um, so that would be the structure. Um, the curriculum, we, and we have already embarked on this process. We want to start using the AAP resources in science and social studies for all the students at the grade level. Again, these are things that have multiple entry points. I took the, um, when I was at Hunter's Woods, back in the, you know, I took the um, advanced academic curriculum class because I wanted to know more about you know, what I was seeing. And what blew me away as a special educator was how engaging this curriculum was and how I could see a zillion ways that I could make it work for my special education students. Um, so it, it is very, they're, they're very project oriented. They're very, um, you can take it as high as you want. We can support, um, other, and science and social studies are, 
are not curricula that are hierarchical. You know, you need this before you can do this, before you can do this. They're pretty topic oriented. And so that enables a lot of children, you know, you can approach that from a million different ways. We've already started to use some of those resources in um, some of our classes now, teachers have gone. We also used um, some of it this summer in our Young Scholars program. Um, our plan for this coming summer through our Title I funds is to expand those classes to invite some more kids. And we're gonna be, instead of doing a remedial thing, we're gonna do this enrichment with this high level curriculum. And we're pretty sure it's gonna be very successful. Um, so we would definitely be using those resources for science and social studies for the whole grade level. And then the regrouping and using the advanced resources for those math and language arts groups. So I think for a school our size, this, is the, this will make it work, and it will make it um, those groups that are, in the, that are using that, you know, the math, just as our math is now, we're not diluting down for that group. Everybody that's in there can handle it and, and is successful. Um, it is flexible. Um, if, you, if a child is really not succeeding and it's really too much or there's something going on in their family and they just can't deal with this right now, it's very easy to say, okay, you can you know, join this other group. So I think that flexibility makes it really beneficial for all kids. Um, and so we've had some success with this already. Um, the, this that you see here is actually the program of studies that our teachers use the curriculum guides. There are curriculum guides for the advanced academic um, portion of the curriculum for all the uh, uh, three, four, five, and six. And so that they're already familiar with them. They're already going to them for additional ideas and additional uh, resources anyway. So I think this is not gonna be a big stretch for someone to really be uh, teaching those groups. So. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah. I think at the beginning of the presentation there were 54 schools that have mm -hmm. so of those how many of those are title one schools do you know there are quite a number are um uh west lawn is a title one okay. school anna del terrace has a local level four belvedere has a local level four um oh there's a bunch oh yeah 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 um there there are quite a number in fact i have actually talked to several of those principals to talk about you know how it would work and you know what their experiences were so yeah no it is in fact what happens a lot of times in title one schools you know we'll have students who are um, you know first generation their parents are speaking spanish child qualifies for level four right they don't go or they go and they're like oh this is so out of my comfort zone i'm coming back and we've seen that happen a number of times so I think that will give some of our students an opportunity to have, to still have that challenge, but to do it in a more comfortable place. And that, um, if you know Dr. Zulawaga, he is Colombian, and our um, Hispanic students are very dear to his heart. And that is really what he would like to see, is to give more of those students an opportunity to be able to, to have that challenge as well, and not have to go so out of the Um, we also plan to offer the, we mentioned there are four co courses that teachers have an opportunity to take. I put a three-year window. I w thought it was a three-year window. I didn't realize it was a five-year window. But what we'd like to do is to offer those classes actually here. Um, and we can certainly do that. Margie is, is available to teach some of those. There are also some, have been some online ways to do it. Um, so I think that would, that would not be difficult and we could certainly have, we do have some teachers that have already had one or two of them already. Um, the other piece is the curriculum and uh, probably two years ago, we started aggressively sending people to the training and getting the resources. Um, it was great because they generally pay for the sub so it was nice to be able to do that. 
So we've, um, we've actually have started to use some of the things as a part of what we're, we're already doing. Um, our goal would certainly be to have at least one completely endorsed teacher at a grade level um, to, to serve that, those groups of those advanced academic students. Um, more, more would be great, um, but that would be our, our initial goal. Um, just a little bit from the National Association for Gifted Children. Um, when you're talking about it, I read this quote um, and really thought that this really applies to all our kids. Um, we have to have a continuum. We have to have differentiated options for kids. We have to have different instructional approaches, different kinds of resource materials to meet the needs of all kids. And that's the nature of education today. Gone are the days where you stand there and you deliver the same thing to every child in your class. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, we're very used to differentiating in a lot of different ways already. I see this as just another opportunity for us to um, get really good at some other things and to also give our families an opportunity to stay with us. Um, you know, not, not feel like they have to go elsewhere um, for their students to get that challenge. So, any questions you might have that we might be able to answer? <laughs> Are there any genuine negatives to doing this? Um, the, I mean, I guess the only different negative is if you really want your child to be in a classroom where the only kids there are, you know, advanced learners, then we're not going to be able to do that. You know, we're not going to do that. We're going to have a little bit more variety. Um, you know, that, that has some downside in itself, you know. Um, Sometimes the child that was always the top of the heap goes over there and finds that they're not, and it's very stressful. Um, it's in certain ways, in certain ways. learning. Yeah. Do you want to start that? You right. know, I don't know. Um, you know, there's it just whatever floats your, you know. I have two student, two kids who are now old enough to be probably your age. <laughs> Parent, they certainly are parents. And um, for one of them, he could have handled it. Uh, we weren't here at the time, so you know it wasn't an issue. The other one would have been much more comfortable in this type of a program, and both were equally. equally and I didn't see any negatives. I was just curious if there yes. was a negative identified yes. by the school. Um, I couldn't see. I don't know. Um, you know that I've been in both. You know, I I was at Hunters Woods. It it was a large center. We had three um, AAP classes at every grade level, and we had. Um, three, usually three or four regular ed classes at every grade level. Um, you know, it was, it's a lot of kids being brought from a lot of different places, and for some kids that was fine. Other kids, I think it was a little stressful. Um, I, you know, sometimes I thought um, the instruction might have even been somewhat better in the regular general ed classes because they were dealing with a, a wider variety of kids and you had to you know, really be on your toes and think about different instructional strategies. Um, whereas some of our teachers at that time, you know, and again, that was you know, 13, 14 years ago, so it was, what, it was a different era, but you know, they, the assumption was if you're here, you can handle it. I don't really need to differentiate. I don't think that's the case now, but I think we're, you know, we're all more used to that. Um, I mean, I, I think it would be nice. I know I've heard for a number of years people would like to stay in, a, in the community. It's a long haul to Mantua. Um, if you do the bus, you know, they're, they're leaving before our kids are arriving. They're coming back. We watch, we have some kids in SAC. And they're getting back long after the kids have left. So, you know, there's that. I have a level three fourth grader and yeah. she could have gone and we chose for social reasons not to so yeah. I love the fact that it could be coming. Right. right. I, I don't personally believe this way but I think the only negative or one could be possibly of, with the kids themselves the social distinction of oh you're in the smart kid class right. versus which is one reason which I did see at <coughs> Hunter's World. 
um, the stigma. Yeah, what we did there, well, what we did there was um, all of the students went to their specials in mixed up groups. Yes. So they weren't in classes. The way, the way, the proposal we've done is specifically to avoid that, is having them not, I mean, we're not going to have a whole class, we're too small, to have a whole class of level four eligible kids. Um, so they're going to need to be in classes. It's the same structure. And we can regroup, yeah. and they're still going to have both experiences, which I think is, is pretty healthy. You know, you get an opportunity to work with all different kinds. As a fifth grader with him here, and it's for that reason I wanted him to be able to socially mix with whoever and get along with not just people who think like him, or you know, and that's exactly why. Sure. So I and I know for, for my um, personal children um, who, had we been in Fairfax, would have been center eligible, I think it was very good for them to be not to not have that option because they were in their regular schools they were yeah. dealing with and I think as they've gone on in the workplace it's really benefited them because they they know how to work with all different kinds of people they're not just limited to you know people that get it as fast as they do and you know that kind of thing it's it's it, and it also gave them an opportunity when they didn't get it. You know, you always run into that thing. For me, it was sec it was subtraction in second grade. That was a wall, you know. And you start to feel like, wow, I've always been considered smart, and now I'm not smart. And it was a lot easier to deal with, I think, when that happened, when they weren't, you know, being compared. So, I mean, I think, and again, I think it's a family decision. Well, all I can say is stay tuned. We will be um, finishing the writing of our proposal with the, we have a group of teachers that are working. I'm sorry, I have one more. Yes. Is there an opportunity for it to be declined through the process? Yes. You refer um, to an approval process. Is there a not approval process? I don't think so, okay. really. <laughs> if I think that tight in the community supports it, I have a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the key is involving, I mean, I think if I was trying to do something that Dr. Zulawaga was not in favor of, or the way I was going to do it, was that was something that really bothered him. I would could definitely see him saying no, but I think by including him in the process and by, you know, listening and being on the same page with what he envisions is is probably key. So yeah. Uh, and can you? Will we be able to make your slides available at some point, either on um, our website or on your? Yeah, I can. I'll. I can. Put them there. <coughs> okay. I'll put them on the website. Okay. Maybe with some explanation, because mm -hmm. you know, I hate the slides when there's no. <coughs> but the survey results might be interesting. Yeah, and those will definitely be. We'll put those up for sure. For sure. Thank All you right. so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to, can you quickly do nope. yeah. okay. okay. We only have 20 copies. Uh, normally, gamings are not that popular. So <laughs> if you guys could share amongst yourselves, that would be great. This is not as hard to read as it is uh, right now. Maybe we can turn the lights back on. I don't know. Um, normally, I would just give you last month and current month, and it would be in a portrait form, and it would be a little bit easier. But I wanted you to see the last four months of the fiscal year, sort of the timing of the uh, expenses that we have. 
Um, so you can see if we, uh, first we'll look at the expenses. So those are at the bottom. It's split into two parts. The top part are all the, the receipts, the income we get. The bottom part are the expenses. Uh, and then at the very bottom, you can see the checking balance uh, carried over from month to month. So it's important for us to end the year, which ends at the uh, end of June, with some money in the bank. Because we end up paying for the CETA certification, and that's $4,000. That comes in August. We also pay for the agendas. That usually comes in August or September, and that was another $1,200 this year. So we do need to build in a cushion uh, for the end of the year, because we have these expenses that we get before we really get any money in the bank. Now, we haven't been in a position, at least the last several years, where that's been a concern. But it's just something to keep in mind. Um, then, on the expense side, I'll just draw your attention, too, to the teacher classroom fund. It's about midway down the expenses. It's a white line. That's been very popular this year. We started that last year. That's $100 that we offer to every teacher if they want to submit some expenses and some receipts to us. So I have another five of those to process, and that uh, I think that'll bring us up to you know, 20, 25 ish teachers that have participated this year. So I'd say that's a great way for us to give back to the teachers and have them have the materials and supplies that they want or need to, um, to help them stay a little bit more organized, which is usually what it is. Usually organization or materials that they provide the kids. Uh, so then I'm going to jump up to the receipts. Um, and I'll draw your attention to two places where I really screwed up with the budget. Um, <laughs> so again, about halfway down, we've got the retail, the Amazon target I give. Uh, so there were a couple of, well, one really, one large check that we got at the end of last year that didn't get deposited to this year. It was um, giant, and they were wrapping up their program. So you got a check for about $1,100. That didn't go in until July, which is this fiscal year. So that even that check alone more than doubled the budget we had for this year. So I don't expect that huge number to continue, but that's a, a one-time thing. Uh, and then we'll continue to get a couple of iGive and uh, Amazon wish list throughout the year. So I think those will trickle in. So don't expect that number to go up too much. But that's why you see this big number that's way more than we budgeted for. Um, then on the negative side, the strings camp, we ended up paying for um, the teachers and all of the expenses for the strings camp in October. So that was about a $5,500 check. Um, but not all of the, some of the um, tuition checks were deposited last fiscal year. So not all of that money uh, is in this fiscal year. So right now we're carrying a negative balance of 2300 for Strings Camp instead of a positive thousand dollar balance. Um, and that's not going to get any better unless we offer Strings Camp again and deposit all the money before the, the year. Um, and then I have a ton of money from Spiritware and the bake sale and memberships to deposit this month. Um, so this trend of uh, a negative balance in the checking account should come back uh, when we hand out the November. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And so then while we're thinking about our budget, um, do you want to talk about the document cameras? Yeah, sure. Which is the last sort of big item on our list. So something that came up at our last meeting was this idea of a pet project for every year, which is, um, it, it's a nice idea because it gives us some visibility. So for all our fundraising, we actually have something at the end of the year to show for our efforts, and um, which is just kind of a nice thing in general. And Bridget solicited from the teachers to see you know, what ideas were out there. and. Honestly, there was kind of a dearth of ideas. So, well, and I mean, this was the one. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This has been the thing that teachers were, you know, really interested in having. And so, 
when you really push them. And Bridget's to, referring to the stock right. which is when I really, you know, yeah. okay, guys, tell me, you know, um, that was pretty much what they said. Well, I'd so really like to have. Yeah. That's good. And so one of the things that came up just standing here and, and yeah, in I subsequent know. conversations was the idea of iPads. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of uh, opened a dialogue, and I talked with Ms. Chapin and then also Ms. Gavin about that, and then also Mr. Delaney, who's the um, IT, I don't know his title specifically. He's the technical um, And one of the questions we had was, what does the county have planned for technology? And if we decide to supplement technology, we want to make sure we're not stepping in and doing something that's coming down the pike anyway. So um, he is probably going to come and do a presentation for us and talk about what the county has in store. But um, one of the things that came up in talking with the teachers was this idea of an interactive visualizer. So it sounds super high tech, but essentially what it is is when we were kids, we had the overhead projector. It's just, you know, you write on the marker on the film and it passed on to the, you know, the board and you're good to go. And so those days are over now with the smart board. But um, this is essentially a small, it's an immature of the actual piece of equipment, but it's a camera and it functions much the same way and it talks to the smart board. Um, I think it can even project on a flat surface. Uh, you can, you know, put a piece of paper, you can put a book, you can put a tablet, you can put an iPad, your you iPhone. Can your right. In real time. This is right. the, to me, the most exciting use of it is, you know, your kids are writing and you get ready and somebody's done something and you want to show the whole class, you can just put it under the document. We've never been able to have that kind of capability, right. you know, before you would have had to scanned it in, you know, it'd be the next day, it wouldn't be that real time. So for example, my son's in second grade and they were studying magnets. Mm -hmm. So it's a great way to kind of, you know, talk show about sure. magnets and have everyone see. Um, and this came up because I asked his teacher, you know, what, if you could have some additional technology in your classroom, what would she use? And she said, well, honestly, these document keepers are really great and I had my parents buy me one right. for the classroom. And so there are a few teachers that are using them already. And she said that whenever teachers see what she's doing, they get so excited and they're like, why can't we have one of these? This is great. So um, we had uh, Mr. Delaney do some pricing and it turns out that they're $273 a piece if we procure them through Fairfax County and we don't pay shipping. Um, we have 22 classrooms. And so um, I guess the question really is, we have to make a determination as a group. Is this something we wanna go forward with? If it is, to what level do we wanna go forward? It, do we want to fund all the classrooms, which is roughly $6,000? Do we want to fund half the classrooms now out of our savings and then fundraise for the rest with the holiday season capital campaign we do anyway? And I have to say I'm a big advocate for this approach because I really feel like people will be far more inclined to give if they can see that there's you know, a, an item that we're giving towards. Um, and then the last option is just to put a cap on our giving and say, let's just give, you know, Mr. Chapin and the staff $4,000 to work with, and should we kind of gauge interest, and maybe we can supplement in the future, but we, we wouldn't specifically commit to that at this time, and then we can just kind of take it from there. So, um, if you want to do a show of hands, do you want to, is, is there a general? Does anybody want to say what they're thinking about this? Yeah, does anyone, you know, have any reservations about this, or? support for the idea or had another idea that didn't come up if we were to only Bridget if we were to go for example with option B for now which is mm -hmm. to sort of say we'll start rolling them in with existing mm -hmm. funds do you think that that's a fair enough approach for teachers that you know it would sort of be a kind of first come first serve well it's kind of a not uh, you know I could put one or two in each grade level they, can they could share, share um, you know we there's a number of ways to do it. Um, at this price, you know, I can't, I don't have $6,000 to put, but I probably can buy a few, you know, here and there. And so, yeah, I mean, as I've said, you know, we'll take whatever, you know, you can, you can do. Um, we do have a few that are floating around, uh, mostly that, you know, teachers have um, that they've bought, but um, it's just, it does seem to be kind of the, the on the wish list of every teacher. So, you know, again, whatever you can do, great. You know, we'll look at some other ways. You know, what are the challenges with option A? Just doing it all right now? Yeah. 
Well, I think that's just how much money you guys want to spend. I mean, I think that that's just, it's just a question of looking at the budget that John just presented. Yeah. I mean, I would say that and that is, and that is would put kind of one in That would put one in every classroom teacher. I still, at some point, want to, you know, put them in the hand. Like, I want to put one in. And yeah, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Jonathan Kettler, you know, what he needs. He uses technology a lot. That would be a great option for him. Um, so, you know, at some point, I'd like to have, you know, some one available for, for everyone. Um, but, so, you know, option that's B, fine. what um, kind of historically have we been able to raise through the holiday council campaign order of magnitude? So I think it's on the, Is it on the budget table. Well, so last year, two years ago, we raised about five thousand dollars. Last year, we raised uh, approximately twenty five hundred dollars, and so our somewhat stretch goal this year was three grand. Uh, but last year, it was more just you know, give to the PTA because we support all of these different programs, like the field trips and the. Right. Mm -hmm. Certification. Mm -hmm. I think that if we went out and with a specific item in mind and generated some interest, we could definitely uh, pull in our goal and, and mm -hmm. create awareness also with the parents as to you know what the PTA is doing and the benefits for their kids and youth. So above the twenty-two cameras, how many more for like the specials or Spanish teachers or whatever mm -hmm. would the school desire? Do you know the numbers? You know, I don't. I sent them to Leah. It's sorry, it would be on my phone. Yeah, let me see if I can I can find it, Leah. I think it was thirty six or something above. It would would be another fourteen, yeah. fifteen above the classroom teacher. Right. Yeah. It was roughly that. If the benefit to phasing them in is that they do require minimal training. I mean oh, like yeah. Mr. Well, Duran was saying plug and play. he sets it up and shows yeah, them how to do it and then you could could kind of roll them out, you know, based on you initial could. interest, yeah. and then follow up as it kind of catches on. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this. Some people have just, you know, found a way to buy one. The other way would be to have them available and then, you know, have them checked out. We could place one in every grade level, plus place one, you know, with the specialist. As we work toward, mm -hmm. you know, having everybody that that really wanted one. Um, most of our special ed and ESL teachers are working within a classroom, having, they probably don't each need one, but maybe having a couple for them to, to share would be fine. I mean, again, we'll make it work with whatever you want to do, and then now that I know it's a high item for them, if I have, you know, money I can throw at it, then I can buy it to you, and, you know, we can go from there. Um, but these are already being used at other elementary schools oh, yeah. in Fairfax County to yeah. great success. In fact, so we had a not, we had a, um, a professional development for all the principals the other day, and um, the literacy <laughs> specialist that was doing it, the the, the presenter from I forget where she's from, but anyway, she had one, and she was actually going around taking our questions and making notes and drawing things based on what we were doing, and then she put that down as we shared. You know, I thought, well, that's a cool way to do it. You know, actually take specimens from every everybody's ideas. You can also record. That's the other mm -hmm. thing is whatever gets projected gets recorded. Yeah. So this is maybe a little advanced, but our upper years might be, if we ever do go towards the dual classroom and, and we are, you know, so making yeah. on Blackboard, making lessons available online, yeah. that would be a great way right. to do it. Just sort of supports yeah. the direction that education is moving in. From the research that I did, just preliminarily, it's this is really the number two classroom aid in addition mm -hmm. to iPads. Mm -hmm. So that's what I saw. The only other comment I wanted to make on just thinking about the amount is when I when I sat in PTA meetings last year and I would look at the sort of bottom line of the checking account and I would always say like, ah, oh, why aren't we spending some of this money? And <laughs> because it just seemed like you know like I didn't see what the point of was having this money sitting in the checking account. Having said that, and now being involved in the day to day, I do think. You know, the, these funds can be hard to come by. Jessica sat out at the bake sale for like 12 hours mm -hmm. on election day, and we made $700. Now, I mean, of course, bake sale is different. Movie night, <clears throat> we can bring in $1,000, but it's a lot of work. You know, we have gingerbread house, which I think makes like a little, it's minimal. It's, it doesn't really, mean, yeah, once you buy all this stuff, I mean, that's not really intended to be a fundraiser mm -hmm. anyway, but it does sort of, so suddenly it's like, when thinking about $3,000 versus $6,000, and I just think, 
we're going to work really hard to earn back that $3,000, that $6,000. So I think for me, I was maybe a, a little bit more in favor of option, option B. But then I also think we have this money, you know, we should put it towards the school instead of letting the students just make this choice. I mean, so it's the other way. Could there be like a shift in the proportionality? Maybe instead of 22 and 11, like 17s, like go for something like that? and. I'll take whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to turn it over. Uh, no. Sure. Yes. No. Whatever. I'm trying to find my thing with the. Yeah, it seems like buying a few up front gives you a chance to get some testimonials that then you can advertise at the holiday time. You know, maybe at least one at every grade level and a couple of the special teachers. And you can kind of say, look, these are the kind of things that you can do with it. Uh, and then sort of see what we can raise. That's true. Specific it's also cautious. Examples. Right. In the sense that, in case it doesn't catch on, mm -hmm. you haven't invested in something that where there's equipment that's kind of sitting around. So, I know you're not worried about it, but, <laughs> but we would. It's for fun and fun. Um, do you want to? I mean, if you can, we just have a show of hands. So, is there? Uh, is how many of us are in favor of going after a pet project like this for this year? Is this a good idea? Okay, good. And. How many of us are in favor of partial funding for now? Um, how many of us are, I suppose the options are uh, setting, saying half now and half later, or setting a cap on it? So $4,000 gets us 14 if we were to go up to 17, that's another maybe 700. So what if we set a $5,000 cap? <coughs> That's what 17 would do. So all in favor of the $5,000 cap, raise your hand. But the cap is right now, and then we would. And then I think that would be the limit. We wouldn't continue to fundraise. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the limit. I mean, we'll still do a, a capital well, campaign. Mm -hmm. But just not topic specific. Why don't we just see how much we get? Yeah, For the capital yeah. campaign? Right, we don't have a cap. Just bring it on. Well, Let's like, what, what if we were to spend the $5,000 and then fundraise for the mm -hmm. remaining with the capital campaign because like I know personally if someone said okay well these cameras are detrimental to your child's classroom and they cost $273 what can you provide instead of providing like five bucks it might give 50 you know and mm -hmm. so if you have something tangible and right. you're saying that it helps your kid like you're more willing to give more yeah, that's a good point that's how I feel about it um, I found my little thing um, if we wanted, like, what I wrote out was kind of like, okay, I could see this for, if we kind of had them universally, um, it would be about $11,000. But again, you know, any increment up to that, great. You know, we'll, we can keep going on it or, you know, whatever. So are we discussing spending money that we currently have in a checking account in addition to future funds that we could raise? That was I think that's the kind of compromise we're looking to okay. arrive at. Okay. Understanding that a certain amount of cushion, as Don just pointed out, is important to carry <coughs> in the balance of the account, particularly at the beginning of the year before you've done fundraising and you have outlay of cash. Right. So, um, the, I will point out that the difference of a thousand dollars between four thousand and five thousand is only three cameras. So it's, I mean, now we're kind of getting into. Shades of gray. Um, I, so maybe we should just say all in support of funding partially now and then funding the rest after the capital campaign. Can we agree on that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to set? Do you want to set quantities? Should we say half now or? I mean, should we say ten or eleven now, mm -hmm. and then so we'll see what we see raise what we in the capital later. campaign? Sure. I think option yeah. B. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the odds are very good that we'll have enough based on what John is talking about. The typical outcome from, and I hope we'll do even better, knowing that this is kind of the stated goal. So, okay. So, if we have a direction, that's great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Minister, yeah. Yeah. Administrative point there. So, we either need to fund this out of one of our line items on the budget, or we need to vote to amend the budget to include a line item for the $3,000. Because right now there's no, there's there's no, no place to place it today. put the check. 
for the camera. So we could either add a line or a vote to take it out of cultural assemblies, which is already the only line item large enough that doesn't, uh, that we don't have a specific program in mind for. Or we could add another line. Could it be like a teacher classroom one that is going into each classroom? It's like teacher. Um, it could, but then we would need we're to bump still, that up. And we're still getting requests for that hundred dollars. I mean, I just gave John one tonight. Yeah. Yeah. So you, right, you can see there's only a thousand dollars left there, and I we have a lot of outstanding checks. <laughs> so we could. Um, I would call it the pet project pet proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Can you add yeah. a pet project line? Can we add on the sure. pet line? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. Do we need to vote on that officially? Uh, yes, we do need to vote officially. Okay, so all in favor of adding a line to the expenses budget for the PED project of, in the amount of $4,000, I think is what we agreed on mm -hmm. tonight. Okay. To fund, or to, for option B would be 3010 Well, so that's the initial, but we do plan to spend more. The total budget is right. six. So total, so then the, for the total budget of 6000 Right. Thank you. Okay. Can we comfortably accommodate the six thousand dollar line item add to the to the uh, We could, if we you know if we didn't do as long as we raise our three thousand dollars that we plan to from the direct donations, um, you know then we would end up the year at approximately thirteen thousand dollars in the deficit, which would leave us at the end of the year with about sixteen fifteen sixteen in the bank. Um, thanks everybody for staying so late. There's uh, two events. So there is an assembly on um, November 17th in conjunction with Math Night. Uh, the PTA's funding is Joe Romano is coming to do superhero math. So <laughs> he was apparently awesome last year. Um, there's uh, Gingerbread House and movie, our first movie night in December and then Gingerbread House. If you want to sign up for those, you haven't done it yet. I heard it went home in today's folder and then we have flyers out on the back table. We did get the directory up and running. Um, we're still kind of sorting out some details about that. If you want to like pilot the directory for us, please email me at ldwolf at gmail.com and we'll send you the link and you can like set up your account and uh, that way you have access because um, my husband works really hard on it. <laughs> I'm getting that ready to go parent directory. And then we can talk as soon as people get their accounts and go in and like confirm their information, then we can get printed directories hopefully by the spring because I know that those are so important, you know, uh, year after year. Uh, so I think there's any other questions? <coughs> I didn't thank you again to Jessica for the bake sale. Oh, what? If this? anyone did not pick up their membership card for me and you membership have time, card? a few minutes, come see me now. We were supposed to do discounts a at events, PTA branch events. We were supposed to do a raffle for membership, but I, you know, there are a couple more membership applications in the box right. down there. So why don't we <coughs> do it next time? But thanks everybody for joining the PTA. Um, Is there any other outfit? Mm -hmm. Uh, we, so yeah, th thanks to Jessica and sat out all day at the bake sale. We raised seven hundred dollars. We've already got signups rolling in for the next events coming up. So good job. yeah, it was actually Thank good you, to Jessica. have a distraction on. Oh, it was great. Everybody was wonderful. Oh yeah, we do in the as soon as we get past this hump, we do want to send out um, a teacher and parent survey on enrichment programs to see what are the activities that you want to see for enrichment, and then for the teachers. Are there other teacher-led programs that you know teachers are wishing we had? So we're going to try to gather some data on that, and then roll out some new programs in the spring. But um, I think enrichment will be worth it this year. Yeah. So, okay. Anything else? Any other business? Thanks everybody for coming. There's still bake sale items on the table. <laughs> <laughs>